Jacob Howland, thank you very much for joining us. You're a professor of philosophy at the University of Tulsa. And I think as is probably the case for a lot of people, you know, your name uh, became familiar to me because of things you've written about what's happening at the University of Tulsa. Um, and so, you know, we could start, I think, well, the, the, the conversation will be broader and, and I'm just interested in hearing your thoughts about what's going on in, in higher ed, higher education generally. But to, to, to kick things off, could you just give us a quick sort of sketch of, of what has made things at the University of Tulsa particularly difficult over the past couple of years? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me, Preston. I'm uh, yeah. pleased to be here. Um, so our problems started, uh, well, really in the summer of 2018 when um, we got a new chairman of the board of trustees and uh, a new provost. Uh, we had had a president who came in in 2016, um, and they decided uh, to undertake a radical review of our academic structure. Uh, they formed a committee called the Provost Program Review Committee, which uh, consisted of some professors and administrators. Everybody was required to sign a non-disclosure agreement uh, and included nobody from the humanities or national sciences. Hmm. Natural science. And... Um, they uh, went through a sort of a nine month process and then sprung a recommendation on us. Uh, well, it wasn't just a recommendation, it was uh, already approved by the board and it was announced on April 11th, 2019. And that was uh, to eliminate roughly 40% of the academic programs, uh, essentially gutting the liberal arts, languages, mathematics, uh, philosophy, religion, um, history, chemistry, all sorts of things like this. Wow and to uh, eliminate departments, uh, dump all professors into large divisions, including one that was named at that time the Division of Humanities and Social Justice. They've since dropped the social justice part. Um, combine the colleges of law, business, and nursing into a super professional college. Um, wow. and increase, uh, in, increase base teaching loads from uh, two, three to four, four. Hmm. Um, and, uh, it, changed the character of the school. Uh, we used to be a top 100 university. In fact, in 2012, we were ranked 75th in the nation mm. in the category that starts with hard and so forth. Uh, we fell to 106 in 2019, and now we're at 121. We're just plummeting like a rock. Wow. Um, faculty uh, took this very badly and organized uh, against it, but um, everything we've done has uh, had no impact whatsoever on the university. Most recently, uh, Moody's has downgraded our bonds uh, two notches to just above junk. And we were informed in December that this is after 40% of the academic programs were cut. Now we would see a period of austerity where we have to make up between 14 and $20 million in our operating budget. Things, of course, have gotten worse with the coronavirus. And a lot of us are now worried that uh, the school will declare financial exigency and uh, may not be able to even continue after a couple of years. Wow. Okay, so hearing all of that, it's easy to understand why, just as someone who's been at the institution for a while, you got there, is it, if I remember correctly, in the late 80s, or I'm sorry? Yeah. Yeah. I got there in 1988, yes. That's mm -hmm. what I thought. So you've been there a long time, so obviously in terms of your life, you've got a lot of buy-in in this, in this institution. And so these massive, yeah. go ahead. Oh, just... no, I was gonna say, I mean, I, as an assistant professor in 1988, I'm now the McFarland professor, uh, McFarland professor of, uh, excuse me, of philosophy. And uh, I've uh, taught at the university for 32 years, uh, had excellent students. I can name half a dozen students right now who are tenured or tenure track professors uh, at universities and colleges around the country. Um, I've very much enjoyed my teaching. I've had a, a terrific opportunity to conduct my research, uh, published quite a few books and articles, and this has all come crashing down, and I'm not the only one who feels uh, deeply depressed about the situation. Yeah. Do you feel, so we're talking about, you know, so just at the level of simple psychology, I think everyone can understand why it would be distressing to see such massive changes in, in an institution. Mm -hmm. Do you also feel that 
I, there's no gentle way to to ask this question, so I'll just put it as bluntly as it is in my mind. Mm -hmm. do, do you also feel that the school has, in some sense, been attacked by anti-intellectual barbarians? Oh, absolutely. Um, the fact is that uh, we had a president, uh, I say had because he resigned in January, saying that uh, he told his wife that if the job affected his health, he would quit. And time came at the end of January. Yeah. Um, it certainly has affected the health of pretty much everybody that I know. Um, yeah. But in any case, the president had no PhD. Uh, he was an MD. The provost lacks a PhD. She is now the interim president. We are told by the chair board that she will remain until our financial situation stabilizes, which could be years off. Um, they don't have any feel for liberal education. Um, they have turned the school into a vocational training and really sort of trade school. Um, mm -hmm. Things like uh, computer data entry, uh, you know, uh, various technical topics, nursing, uh, um, cybersecurity, things like this. Yeah. Um, the language that they use in their official communications is cliche ridden. Mm. Uh, the provost, when she out the, uh, the, the restructuring plan, which was called true commitment, uh, uh, spoke about our secret sauce, you know, uh, being the faculty, the president has a hard time writing, um, grammatical sentences. Um, well, previous president, Gerard Clancy, who resigned in January. Um, but another thing that needs to be understood, and people can read my City Journal article or they can read an article in The Nation I published called Corporate Wolves in Academic Skins. Uh, what needs to be understood there is that uh, the school has offend, essentially uh, suffered a corporate raid. It's been taken over by a, a billionaire philanthropic capitalist named George Kaiser. Uh, who is the majority shareholder in the Bank of Oklahoma. Janet Levitt, the current interim president, is the wife of Ken Levitt, who's the CEO of the George Kaiser Family Foundation. Yeah. Gary Clancy was on the board of the Bank of Oklahoma Financial. Uh, the chairman of the board is the general counsel to the Bank of Oklahoma Financial and the president of the George Kaiser Family Foundation. Yeah. Stephen, uh, the CEO of the Bank of Oklahoma, is on the board, as is another fellow who's a closely associated with the Bank of Oklahoma. Yeah. Bank of Oklahoma, by the way, is the sole corporate trustee of uh, the University of Tulsa's endowment. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so there are ethically bewildering uh, conflicts that really make your head spin when you take a look at what's happened. Right. And their interests really are of, uh, local Tulsa business. They, they're not interested in education. They're not interested mm -hmm. in the traditional role of university, which is yeah. essentially innovation, transmission, and cultivation of knowledge. Let me let me pick up on that. Suppose uh, you know you you refer to liberal learning, the humanities in general. You just referred to education as traditionally conceived. Suppose I walk into a meeting of these people, and I say, "Look, the reason why the humanities are important, the reason why Shakespeare is important, the reason why Aristotle, Marcus Aurelius, the reason why this stuff is important." is because no matter what position a person has in the economy, whether as a nurse, whether as an architect, whether as a mechanic, we want people who are not only educated in mind, but educated in soul, right? In the, in, in, in the, Greek, the classical Greek sense of the mm -hmm. soul, the animating force of the person. Would they have the slightest idea what I was talking about if I said that to them? And, and the reason, the reason I, I asked that question is because I've, over the years, I've said that kind of thing in academic context, speaking to other professors, talking in that way about the, you know, the formation of the soul, the, the, the tremendous usefulness of studying Shakespeare. Because if you give this genius a chance and you let him teach you, you'll think better, you'll have a deeper understanding of the world, you'll probably see some flaws within yourself, there's, 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 there's nothing more useful than giving Shakespeare time, the formation of the soul. But I've often been struck by how even in academic settings, I get these looks of stony incomprehension 
Does that, so what, what do you think? If I, if I walked into this group and, and talked in terms of, uh, I'm, you know, we need nurses for sure, and we need lawyers for sure, but we need learn, nurses and lawyers who, in addition to having good knowledge, are also, they also possess well, well, formed souls, right? Would they have the slightest idea what I'm, what I'm talking well, about? Well, I've been trying to make this argument and it has really fallen on deaf ears. So I don't think that they're particularly receptive to it. I want to say a couple of things about this. You know, liberal education, first of all, it's important um, in terms of helping our students. Now, you know, our strategic plan that was formulated in 2017 uh, states that we want to focus on first-generation college students, which is really a big shift. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother was the first person in our family to go to college, and I very much want to teach first-generation students. But as the um, uh, chief executive officer and general secretary of Phi Beta Kappa told us a couple of months ago when he came to visit the university, what we're doing is trying to prepare students for their first job. And he said, you should prepare them for their 10th job. Students are going to have many different uh, kinds of employment over the course of their lives. And uh, we're essentially cheating them uh, because a liberal education gives them the flexibility to assess, to judge, to learn, um, and to have the confidence to undertake uh, new careers, new endeavors, and so forth. Mm. Let me go beyond that. Um, and, and this is the kind of argument that, that we've tried to give to our administrators who focus on what they call student success, which means getting students into, into jobs. Um, liberal education mm -hmm. saves lives. James Stockdale uh, spent seven years at Hanoi Hilton. Yeah. And he wrote a beautiful piece saying that uh, he was saved by his study of the Stoics. You know, yeah, he had- yes, That's right, I know that, yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I got an email from a student uh, who, uh, was uh, three degrees, three credits short of a philosophy major. Mm. He was having to be an expert in cybersecurity. And he wrote to me, um, among dozens and dozens of students, by the way, but his story stands out. He said he was in a terrible uh, snowboarding accident. His leg was crushed. Um, and he finally decided he had to amputate his leg. And he was uh, in the pits of despair. And he said that what he learned in my classes and in other classes like mine is how to write and how to think. And he began to write about his experience mm. and he entered a slam radio hour contest and he won. Mm. And, and now he writes. And he said that that ability saved him. Yeah. Uh, I, could, I could give further examples, but, um, you know, I say all this, uh, obviously my perspective is that uh, universities are a precious institution. They train people to be citizens. They train people to be broad-minded thinkers, yeah. flame the light of culture and civilization. Yeah. Um, that isn't, I mean, you know, from my perspective, that's important because I see my work as part of this sort of great chain of cultural transmission. Yeah. Students um, studying uh, Shakespeare, uh, studying Beowulf, studying Dante. Frankly, it helps you how to live and it helps you to die. It helps you to oh, deal. Oh, there it is. That's it. And, and to deal with the suffering that, that you will be dished out, you know, and you're going to have to handle. That's People it. Be human beings. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, that's it. I tell my students, I ask them, how many of you, you know, the, all the brochures you looked at at the different colleges, you know, I asked them, how many of the brochures you look at said, come here because our primary goal is to get you ready to die, right? right. You know, that's the great mission, right? You yeah. know, it's coming, get ready, you know? Yeah, yeah. And uh, so anyway, I, 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 I hear you completely. Do you, do, you, um, do you think that in a way, you know, some of what the humanities are experiencing now, you're experiencing it in, in extreme form, do you feel that some of it we do deserve because let me let me put it this way i was you know doing something yesterday and and thinking about you know coming to a text like shakespeare and you know kind of saying to shakespeare look you know you're obviously a lot smarter than i am you're obviously a lot more perceptive than i am 
So I'm coming to you in sort of a, a disposition of humility, you know, and I know that you have something to teach me. But often the disposition, of course, in the academy is to approach the text from a disposition of power. How can I make myself look clever by what I say about this? How can I enhance my status by what I say about this? And we do need to critique and publish and all of that stuff. But my, my question is, do you think that, that the humanities sometimes, when the claim is that it's irrelevant, that sometimes that's the fault of people within humanity, within the humanities, who haven't really, you know, who, who haven't attempted to make it relevant. You know, here's, here's what Dante has to do with you. Here's what Shakespeare has to do with you. Here's what Epi Epictetus has to do with you. I love that essay by, by Stockdale, you know, how Epictetus mm -hmm. saved his yep. life. You know? um, yeah, and, and, you know, and, and, and here's why, you know, 21st century Americans freak, you know, why, you know come, to, come here because, you know, our primary goal is to help you prepare to die. You know, that sounds awful these days, but that's the, that's the traditional thing, right? I mean, death is coming, get ready, you know? Every, every minute's passing by, life's like a vapor, get ready, you know? Make the most of every minute. Um, but I wonder if a lot of that stuff has, has been forgotten within departments of humanities themselves, and in some way, if, if kind of what you're experiencing in kind of an extreme form, but what all of us are experiencing generally, if some of it is our own fault because we have kind of failed to convey how relevant this stuff is to, to ordinary life. What, what do you think about that? There's no question about that. Um, and the problem has been exacerbated by uh, identity politics, political correctness, you know. Mm -hmm. These texts are to be approached with an open mind in humility, as you say. Mm -hmm. um, and what undergraduate students and graduate students, I should add, want to do is to study these classic texts, to, to, to learn from people who are wiser than they are. What so often happens, uh, and it's deplorable, especially it happens in undergraduate classes, is that these living, vibrant, powerful texts are um, pushed through a sieve, a sort of steel mesh, uh, Wendell Berry wrote an essay in the, in the early 70s, or maybe it was the late 70s anyway, it was a long time ago, in which he talked about how a liberal education is like the trunk of a tree, right? And then you can specialize and you can, you can if you've got that trunk, you can go out into the branches. Mm. He said that in the modern university, the, the uh, limbs had been lopped off and they're sort of just flailing around. They're not connected to a trunk. Mm further and say today that the limbs have been pushed through a wood chipper and fed through this sieve. Mm. And of course I can multiply anecdotes about people who have, you know, an art history professor who said to me that um, beauty is a product of whiteness. You know, I was at a classics conference and a, a young Princeton uh, professor gave a lecture in which she claimed that Aristotle uh, had uh, imprinted her with uh, sort of ineradicable racism. Um, I find these claims uh, unbelievable, incredible, but more important, um, you know, it, it, the whole purpose of education is, is to allow oneself to be informed by people of greater breadth of mind and depth of soul than we are. That's why, they, that's why these classics have survived. That's right. And it, it, really, it really creates a huge problem because, you know, I've actually published quite a bit on the situation at the University of Tulsa, and yeah. I tend to get two sorts of comments in the main. Um, and they tend to be sort of divided across the political spectrum. People on the right say, great, push what is falling. Let these departments that have been, you know, sucking up uh, public money to, uh, to uh, feed ideology to students, let them fail. Mm on the left um, who are generally more supportive of the kinds of things that are done in the academy today, nonetheless are sort of end up being apologists for the emphasis on technical and vocational skills because they say, look, universities have an outward facing mission to help their communities and to lift the poor up into mm. you know, uh, jobs and careers and so forth. Yeah. Um, the only people who tend to resonate with the sorts of things I've been saying and the sorts of things you've been saying are academicians, actually. So it's a tough sell. Um, yeah. 
is that at my university, uh, you know, we have our fair share of, um, of uh, people who uh, tend to think of the academic mission as practical and pushing political agendas and so forth. Yeah. We also have an outstanding honors program. I, I think it's one of the best in the country. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and we have excellent, excellent majors in the humanities. And, and that's where real teaching and learning still gets done. So there's something still to be saved. Yeah. Do, do, you, do you find, though, that, that students generally, when you say, look, we're going we're gonna to look at this text and, and we're not going to approach this text from the disposition of power, we're going to, you know, you don't use these, these exact words, but your vibe is basically, we're not going to yeah. approach this text from a disposition of power. We're going to approach this text from a disposition of, for lack of a better word, humility. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you know, I've written books too, but I tell my students, you know, none of my books have the chance of standing the test of time. Right. Augustine's on Christian teaching, yes. Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, yes, right? Those books have stood the test of time. Right. And so for, for that reason, we're going to show some deference to the multitude of generations, one after another of which have said, this is worth the time. And so then you go for it and you, well, what do these people have to teach us? Julian of Norwich from the 14th century, what does she have to teach us? Um, do you find that students resonate with that when, when it really is about, oh, man, let's, let's meet these people soul to soul and learn from them rather than from the disposition of ideology and power? Very much so. Uh, and I don't even really have to uh, address them in, in precisely the sort of way that you have laid out, although I think it's an excellent way to present it. Mm -hmm. As I just really dive in and say, look, let's look at these ideas. Um, and I make my students write all the time. And what I find is that um, the natural inclination, for example, of um, college freshmen is to sort of pull out these cliches. So you might be reading uh, Greek tragedy. And I'll get um, a number of papers uh, that talk about uh, how women were oppressed and, you know, kind of analyzing this from through the lens of, let's say, roughly speaking, contemporary feminist concerns. Right. And then I'll just gently correct and say, look, first of all, you know, you might be making these claims, but perhaps you don't know as much as you might about the situation of women in ancient Greece, what their rights were and so forth. Mm -hmm. And just kind of nudge and correct them and call them back to the text. I think the important thing that I tell them, uh, pretty much in every course is, look, if you are um, a radiologist, an x-ray is your data. It's your evidence, and you have to analyze it, and you need to sort signal from noise. Mm -hmm. I teach the texts are the data, they're the evidence, and what we need to do is learn to sort signal from noise, and we don't want to produce our own noise, right? Our own mm -hmm exceptions that we bring to the yeah, tech. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we want to try to hone in on that signal. It's like the old days when you had an antenna on your roof and you'd move it around and, you know, try to get the right, get yeah. the right signal. Um, and I think they respond to that pretty quickly because look, I mean, you know, as you know, teaching is a craft and it, it, it yeah. takes a while to, well, it, you know, none of us are as good as we could be. We work at it every year to get better, but mm it a long time and I think that uh, opening up the text in a way uh, that speaks to them is something that I hope every good teacher mm. can do yeah they respond to these books they do yeah yeah. yeah 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 what is um I don't want to put you on the spot here but is there you know just I'm sure there are many texts you can think of but is there is there a particular text that comes to mind or a particular idea that comes to mind that you really do like to convey to students, like, you know, here's a, here's a gem that I just love mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. love to convey to students. Like, for example, in my case, it, you know, I love, um, you know, Cordelia right at the beginning of King Lear. I just love her refusal to play this game that her, that her, her dad's putting her into right at King Lear. I just love that. And there's something yeah. about that that's just stuck with me ever since I met Cordelia for the first time when I was 18, you know, and she's been a friend of mine ever since. And I love passing that on to students about why, you know, I don't, I think you can critique Cordelia, you know, I don't think she got yes. it perfectly, but compared to her lying sisters, I think she did a pretty good job. So I, yeah. I, I like yeah. her and I, I admire her. 
can, so I want to pass on. And how about for you? Is there, I mean, I can think of other things, but is there anything for you that you really like to pass on to students, particular to Well, you? well, you know, um, since you're talking about Shakespeare, I happen to be teaching Hamlet right now, although oh, yeah, right on. it's difficult, right? Mm. You know, when if you teach Shakespeare, the the language is the star. You know, I mean. I told the students, look, Shakespeare must like Horatio because he gives him one of the most beautiful lines mm. in literature, right? Horatio and the scene where they, he first sees the ghost and he looks and he says, but look, the dawn in, in the, the morn in russet mantle clad walks o'er the dew of yon high eastward hill, you know? Um, and, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to say that whatever it is I happen to be teaching, uh, I um, consider to be my favorite text at the time. Yeah, sure. Your sure. question in this way. Um, I often begin courses with Plato's cave image, and I think it's it's extremely useful because I show them, look, you know, um, this is a, this is an image of culture, and you can actually, by the way, map all of the philosophical and religious possibilities right onto the cave image because mm. I think it is something, some sunlit upland of truth and being outside of our caves of culture, or there isn't, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and if there is, either we can ascend to it on our own steam through philosophy, or that light has to come down to us, and that's revelation. So mm -hmm. um, I, it's a nice place to begin, but, uh, you know, you mentioned Aristotle. Look, my, my work is, uh, I, I started out studying and have written a couple of books on Plato, certainly have written on Aristotle and ancient yeah. Greeks and so forth but um, uh, I you know I <laughs> I think that in in the last couple of centuries I would say that the real concerns that that the philosophical tradition have have, have, have always pursued have kind of migrated over in to literature and so I've been teaching a lot of literature recently um, yeah. uh, you know questions of, of humanity and meaning. Uh, these things show up in uh, Russian literature. They show up in, um, in uh, obviously, things like Shakespeare and so forth. Uh, Greek tragedy, I do a lot of that as well. Yeah, yeah. Let me ask you a question that's very practical. Um, and that is, you, you mentioned going from a, what was it, a 2-3 or 3-2 load to a 4-4. Four, four. Yeah, 2-3 to 4-4, four, four, right. Yeah, and now as someone who's, you know, been doing 4-4 four, four for 16 years, I've, I've always felt, and, and the idea, and the, the claim is that, well, you know, we're a teaching institution, and so we do 4-4. Four, four. Okay, and so that means, four, you know, teaching institution means a lot of teaching. But the way I've thought of that is, you know, but, you know, teaching takes time, and reflecting takes time, and, mm -hmm. and you know, thinking through your classes, thinking through the personality of each class group. Each class group has its own personality. It takes a lot of time, and I've always felt at a practical level that 4-4, there is something self-defeating about it. Mm -hmm. That yes, it is a lot of teaching, but at some level, it's not possible at least year after year after year to do that amount of teaching really well. That's, that's been my take. What, having made the transition yourself from a, a two, three to a four, four, what, what, what have your observations been just in terms of the practical consequences of this on teaching? Well, I should say, first of all, that they haven't fully implemented the four, four now. I see, okay. What's, what's happened is that um, because um, we've lost professors by you know, they're taking other jobs. 7% of the faculty took an early retirement buyout last year. Um, Positions have not been filled. In fact, uh, our uh, professor in our department who taught Christian and Hebrew scripture retired probably three years ago. That position was eliminated. So <laughs> even before wow. these changes, we had a religion major with nobody teaching scripture. Um, wow. And, uh, but... Um, but what has been happening is we've been picking up quite a few independent study courses. So, for example, I have two independent study courses right now in addition to yeah. normal courses. But let me say this about the teaching. 2-3 um, is a really optimal load, I think, for our university. You know, when I came here, uh, it was explained that, uh, that university valued research, wanted significant research, um, and... Uh, 
but also valued teaching. And we conducted our classes. We regarded ourselves sort of on the model of a small liberal arts college. Yeah. For me, it was optimal because I teach things that I want to research and the teaching has fed my research. Uh, so it kind of works both ways. Um, yeah. Obvious to me that a 4-4 course load, especially what they envision now, which is they've already lifted the, the uh, enrollment caps, right? So the courses are already bigger. Uh, and, I, and I should say, by the way, the idea is, you know, well, I, I suspect that the idea is to make life so miserable for, especially for older professors like me who have higher salaries that will take off uh, and they'll save money, right? And the usually be lower level courses. For example, um, they're getting rid of uh, French and German uh, uh, upper level courses, uh, all the, they're actually getting rid of the language requirement. Um, so courses in language will be lower level, courses in the humanities, courses that will be teaching will be lower level. In the new configuration, uh, given the number of people in our department, I would be able to teach one upper level course every 2.5 years. Mm. So you don't need um, people who have a research agenda or anything like that in order to teach those courses. Um, but in any case, it's clear to me that if I had to teach 4-4 four, four with uh, some courses of 40 students, you know, and maybe others with 20, what have you, it would be impossible to give them the kind of detailed attention that they need. You know very well how much work they need to do in order to become competent writers. Um, yeah. I can't see how, how, how I could pull that off. Um, yeah, no, I think that's, I, I think that's right as a, as a, as a practical matter. Well, um, um, Jacob Allen, I, I really appreciate you, you, you joining us. Let me ask one more question. I'm, I'm looking at a, at a, a quote here, and, and I think we've touched on this already, but maybe this would be a good way to, mm -hmm. to wrap this up. Um, you say, this is a quote from your article in City Journal, published in April of 2019. You say that the crisis we confront, and you're referring specifically to, to the University of Tulsa, but you know, maybe we could expand a little bit. The crisis we now confront is essentially moral and and metaphysical, right? Um, what do you What do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? <laughs> well, uh, you know, I haven't reread the article recently, but oh, yeah, okay. but I can tell you what I think I mean by that. Yeah. Um, we look universities for a millennium have been the repository of cultural memory. And, um, and, and that's absolutely nothing to take for granted. It's exceedingly important. Um, I should mention, by the way, that in our strategic plan, uh, President Clancy, who wrote the plan, actually praised as a model city, Karamei, China. Karamei is in the mm -hmm. yeah. province yeah. Uh, where uh, uh, the majority of the population is Muslim. This is where they actually have a several internment camps and re-education camps in Karamei, wow. the Uyghurs who are being prosecuted. And in the strategic plan, he said, this is a city that was built from the ground up in the last 10 years, absent tradition. This is what he said. Now, wow. it's wow. inconceivable that a university professor would praise a city and a regime that has nothing to do with tradition, that, 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 that looks to, to 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 build a society absent tradition. I mean, that's probably a pretty accurate description of sort of what the Chinese communists are up to. Yeah. Um, and and by now we see the results of, especially with this virus that came out of China and has spread yeah. around the world, and that the totalitarian government there has attempted to uh, yeah. uh, downplay and conceal. Um, so uh, the question is, really for me, are we going to be able to preserve and recover our roots as human beings. Uh, mm, yeah. We're going to be able to consider the possibility that there are transcendent, eternal truths, that there is some kind of compass in this flood of chaos and change, uh, which we're now all experiencing in our, in our self-isolation, um, mm. by which we can take our bearings. Yeah. And, you know, for me, uh, that is what the value of the intellectual tradition is. It points us toward reference points above 
beyond us, um, cosmic, mm -hmm. metaphysical, and moral, uh, that allow us to make our way through this, uh, through the swirling tides of human existence. Yeah. I really think that that's what's at stake. Because you want to say, look, all people need is jobs. They pay money to go to college. They want a career. That's it. Then the question is, will we lose sight of things that, to recur to something you said earlier, are truly useful? You know, liberal education is about the good, the beautiful, and the true. And it's just as useful as what is good, beautiful, and true is for human beings. Those things have great utility. Exactly. No question about it. Well, that, that, that makes sense when you, when you refer to a, a moral crisis. Mm -hmm. My, uh, I'll end up with this, with this just sort of idea, and we'll hear, hear your response. I, I often think of, um, I resist the temptation to sort of make comparisons with, you know, the, the last phase of the Roman Empire, although, I, you know, I, I have to resist that a lot. But, but I, mm -hmm. I, I have in my mind, you know, St. Augustine, mm -hmm. whose lifespan basically corresponds with the unraveling of the Roman Empire, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, the part of the empire he is most associated with, you know, falls uh, not long after he's dead. But I told my students the other day, what inspires me so much is that as Augustine is looking around and seeing his world literally come unglued, he continues to write. Mm -hmm. If you ask Augustine, you know, Augustine, you know, what are you for? You know, why do you exist? Augustine mm -hmm. knows the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. And he has, he has no certainty that his books are going to survive. You know, these, these vandals, they don't care about his books. You know, they'll burn them. They don't care about them. He has no certainty this stuff is going to survive, but he just keeps at it. Yeah. I find that inspiring and kind of, you know, reading your articles, hearing about what's going on, feeling like there is this relentless assault against mm -hmm. things of, of the mind, things of the soul, things of the spirit, the good, the true, and the beautiful. It's sort of a relentless assault. Mm -hmm. um, and it wears me down. Mm -hmm. But I do, I do remember this example of Augustine who just carries on, you know, keeps mm -hmm. at it, keeps at the fight, keeps at the fight. And mm -hmm. thankfully he did because now we can share students things he wrote, you know, that are, that are useful, you know. Um, do, do you, I mean, do, do you resonate at all? I guess the last question is very vague, but do you kind of resonate with that at all, you know, as I pitch that to you? Absolutely. Look, I mean, I could, I could multiply examples. So let's start with Plato. You know, his, his mentor, his dear friend, the most just and capable teacher of philosophy, perhaps who ever lived, is executed by mm -hmm. uh, Democrats returning after a civil war, looking for scapegoats. Mm. Um, I would have uh, probably collapsed. Uh, Plato decides to write 35 dialogues. Mm. Okay. Exiled from Florence in the middle of his life, wrongly accused of corruption, mm. told he can't return uh, with, you know, on fear of being executed. Um, he goes and he writes the greatest poem of all time, this incredible comedy. Yeah. You know, uh, Osip Mandelstam, let me give you another example. This is something that I've written on and been studying Soviet literature. This mm -hmm. is a poet who couldn't be published after the mid twenties. Um, and, uh, he fell afoul of Stalin after he wrote a, a, a poem explicitly criticizing him. And in the last years of his life, he wrote some of the finest poetry he ever produced. Life mm -hmm. Nadezhda Mandelstam uh, and her friend Anna Akhmarova, another very great poet, uh, committed his poems to memory. Mostly Mandelstam was afraid to write them down. Mm. He, he was worried that if the, if the uh, security agents arrested them, you know, they would be persecuted. Yeah. 20 years, Nadezhda and Akhmarova would recite his poems every night. They kept them alive until the early 60s when it was safe to publish them. Uh, one more example. After the destruction of the Second Temple, the Jews lose the locus of contact with God, with God the cultic locus. No more priests. No more sacrifices. What do they do? Well, they respond by saying, 
let's recreate our religion. We'll take these guys who were known as scribes, we'll call them rabbis, we'll decide that wherever the holy Hebrew scripture is, that's our locus of contact with God. And they produced one of the great works of literature Absolutely. Uh, in existence. It's called, it's called the Talmud, 2.5 million words, the Babylonian Talmud over four centuries. Wow. This capacity to rejuvenate ourselves, right, mm-hmm. is, is, is absolutely crucial. I mm-hmm. um, can't remember who said it, but a wise person once said that a citizen is someone who, if called upon, can recreate civilization. Mm. That is a fundamental capacity that is needed. It has to be in reserve. It has to be there for us to be able to reach out right. and, and, and take it and use it. And that's, what I think, also what I mean when I say that what is at stake is moral and metaphysical. That's right. The claim we're trying to keep alive. And I have to say that those examples of people... Uh, with you know greater courage, spirit, intellect, heart than I have, uh, definitely inform me and make me feel like uh, you know the the little problems that I'm suffering and that the academy is suffering right now and that my friends mm-hmm. are suffering. We just have to we just have to keep on we just have to keep on trucking. You know we have carry to on. thing carry on and pass it on. Yep. Yeah. Well then, uh, Comrade Howlin. So you know. Stay strong, and thank you for being in the fight. And uh, I'm I'm very encouraged listening to you. Um, it's you know it's good to know there's a story in the in the Hebrew scriptures. I forget which prophet it is, but mm-hmm. he was feeling sorry for himself and said, "I'm the only one." And mm-hmm. Yahweh said, "No, no, no. There there are others out there. You're not the only one who's safe." <laughs> was that Elijah or Elisha? I forget which which one of those two. But... I can't tell you right yeah, now. You. That's. Yeah. yeah, there's sometimes a feeling like you know you feel isolated or whatever, but uh, it's 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 very encouraging to hear from you, and it's a difficult situation. But I appreciate I appreciate what you do, and I appreciate you taking the time to share your thoughts with us. Well, I certainly appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and to make this connection, and I'm very grateful that you invited me on your show. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye.